This is the search. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Wonderful. That's the, the benefit of being down front when you start church. It's like a third full. By the time you get up here, it's it's packed. So I'm glad you made it. Uh, again, I hope you enjoy the, the feel of this room. I do. It's it's a lot more familiar. Uh, it's a lot better acoustically, I think. And it's just a little more personal. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for tolerating tolerating the uh, the changes that were forced upon us. So hopefully we'll be back downstairs uh, soon. But we do have some decisions to make before we get there. So keep us in your prayers. All right, let's get started. The Gospel of Mark is uh, is a powerful book of the Bible. Obviously, Mark was one of Jesus' friends. Mark actually lived at the same time Jesus lived on the earth. So everything that we have recorded, everything that we hear from him is an eyewitness account or a first-hand account from someone who was with Jesus. And so in the beginning of his book, he does what the Spirit has led him to do. And that is to explain to us who Jesus is. He explains that Jesus is God in the flesh. And that's what the hinge point of our salvation is. If Jesus isn't God, then what good is his death and his resurrection? And so he makes it very clear to show us that Jesus is divine. He is God in the flesh. Then he goes on to show us the power that Jesus had. Because being divine, he could heal the sick. Uh, he, could, he could cure diseases. He could feed people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. And so he showed the power of God. And because of that, a lot of people followed him. Initially, a lot of people said, yay, Jesus. I like this Jesus stuff. It's good for me. But then it got difficult. And Jesus started teaching things that what it meant to really follow him. And a lot of people left. Just that happens today. They show up to church. They think this is pretty cool. This is neat. Look, what, look what's happening. But then when the teaching gets hard, they want to back away. I don't like this, or I don't like that, or I don't agree with this, or I don't agree with that, and they want to pull away. We're going to talk about that a little bit today and how it has an effect on our lives. And so Jesus has just a handful really left that are very close to him, and he pulls them together, and he teaches them what it's going to be like when he leaves. This is what you're going to have to do. This is how you're going to have to live. All right, that's the Do, do You Have What It Takes series that we did. Now we're into What Did You Expect? And this is kind of an in-your-face portion of the Gospel of Mark. Previously, Jesus would heal somebody and say, don't tell anybody. Or he would do something and say, don't tell anybody. Who am I? All right, you're the Christ. Don't tell anybody. But now, now everything is up front. Now he's aggressive. Now he's bringing out just some hard truths that we have to deal with. We've had them week after week. we got another one today. So let's talk it through. A uh, simple illustration came to my mind. Who's, who's seen this before? Anybody? Come on. You know what this is. Right? YOLO. You only live once. Um, this uh, was kind of made popular about seven years ago by some guy named Drake. I don't know who he is. Anybody know who that is? All right. Yeah. Is, know who he is. Uh, he, he built it into a song and then he tweeted something and obviously it just went viral. It says Drake put his label on it. Uh, hashtag YOLO was everywhere. All over social media. Uh, it was regurgitated in everything. You only live once. You only live once. A lot of people just, again, saw it at face value. It was kind of neat. But there are a lot of people who actually embrace the idea. They embrace the idea you only live once to justify taking risks in their lives. They go, okay, you only live once, so I may as well do this, or I may as well do that. Some examples. You only live once, so go ahead and buy that expensive sports car that you really can't afford and you're never going to be able to pay for, but you only live once, so go ahead and do it. Go ahead and, and take those skydiving lessons. <laughs> I always wanted to do that. That's mine. Uh, go ahead, take those skydiving lessons, but risk your life. You've got a wife and a kid and kids, and, and you've got a job, but go ahead, do it anyway. Jump out of a perfectly good airplane and pay for it, right? Because you only live once, right? <coughs> More serious, though, go ahead, sleep with anybody you want. You just met them at the bar. You only live once, right? So go ahead, take them home with you. Go ahead, party like there's no tomorrow because you only live once, and this is as good as it gets. Go ahead, you only live once. A lot of people have embraced this idea that you only live once, you die, and you cease to exist. They won't admit it, a lot of people, but it's true. And so their lives are hopeless. We're going to talk about this today. YOLO is not true. All right, it's kind of neat, it's kind of funny. But we're going to talk about the fact you don't just live once. Everyone will be resurrected. Everyone will have an eternal existence. And what we talk about today makes that determination. And this is one of the most important messages you'll hear. So let's talk uh, through the scriptures. Go with me to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27. They're in the back of the pew if you want. You can stand, please. 
to honor the reading of God's Word. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, beginning of verse 18, this is what says the Lord. Then Jesus was approached by some Sadducees. He's still in the temple. Religious leaders who say there is no resurrection from the dead. They believe in YOLO. They pose this question. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them, and still there were no children. Last of all, the woman also died. So tell us, Jesus, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Jesus replied, Your mistake is that you don't know the Scriptures and you don't know the power of God. For when the dead rise, not if, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But now as to whether the dead will be raised, haven't you ever read about this in the writings of Moses, in the story of the burning bush? Long after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So he is the God of the living, not the dead. You have made a serious error. God, thank you for your word, which is truth. Guide us in it today. Uh, we don't want to leave here making an error this morning. We believe in the resurrection. And Jesus Christ is the greatest evidence of that truth. But we're going to talk it through this morning because I know there are those who doubt. I know there are those who think that you know, even believers struggle with the fact that this world might be as good as it gets. And that is so morbid. So God, may we hear your word today. May we understand it. May we grasp it and apply it to our lives so that we have the hope of the resurrection in our hearts and that will help us to endure the trials of this day and the day, days to come. Those who don't know you, thank you for bringing them here. Uh, they get to hear the greatest message of all this morning, the fact that there is hope in eternal life through Jesus Christ. So God, I pray that today will be the day of their salvation. Uh, just remove me from your word and speak through it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. Again, to set the stage, this is the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Last few days, actually. Um, he's been up front now. In the past, he said, don't tell anybody who I am. But this time, when he comes down to go to the Passover, he says, no, go get a donkey. And that was significant because the king would have ridden into the city on the back of a donkey. So he's declaring, I am the king. And then they're waving palm branches. Again, that would have been a, a, a rescue thing. That they've been rescued, redeemed by God through this individual. And they're laying their coats down in front of him again, showing his majesty. So they believe in it. At least a large group of people believe in Jesus. But even some of them aren't expecting the right thing. They're expecting Jesus to go right into the temple, which is what the Jews are thinking, the leadership are thinking as well. Go in and say, I am here. The king is here. Run out the Romans. You guys get out of here. If I have to, I'm going to kill you and take care of you. My people are going to be on top again. We're going to prosper. We're going to have redemption. And here we go. That's what they expected. But that's not the Jesus that came. The Messiah came to bring peace, peace of heart and mind that comes from being right with God, even in hard times. So they didn't get what they expected. They didn't get what they expected in the temple either. They thought, we are so pious, we are so righteous, we wear the right clothes, we come at the right times, we carry the right scrolls, the right translation of the scrolls, uh, we got the right songs, the right musicians. We have this down so well that when the Messiah comes, he's going to pat us on the back and say, you guys are awesome. But you didn't get that. The very next day, Jesus comes in and says, you guys have created a den of thieves. You have ruined what God has set up. This is supposed to be to reach the lost and to bring them to know God. And you have isolated to such a place. It's just for you. You have failed. You have failed. Again, they had an option. All right, he's the Messiah. We need to believe him. We need to change our ways. All right. Or we need to not believe him. We need to kill him. So they're ready to kill him. They chose the latter. And they've been trying to trap him. They're 0 for 2 so far today as you see they're 0 for 3. 
So let's walk through this trap. This is really neat. I hate to break it to some of you, but YOLO uh, was not pioneered by Drake. All right. Drake was not the author of it. He, he did not create it. These people are using it 2,000 years ago. and They're called the Sadducees. We don't talk a lot about the Sadducees. Usually it's the Pharisees. The Pharisees seem to have the greater hand upon leadership. But it was shared with the Sadducees. The Sadducees uh, were more Hellenistic. They were more worldly. They believed in cooperation with the Romans. They, they, they were more influential. They were more wealthy. They were more intelligent. They, this was the cream of the crop. This was the elite in the Jewish leadership when it came to these Sadducees. But what you heard very clearly, John makes it obvious that their problem was they didn't believe in the resurrection. Their problem was that they thought you just lived, died, and that was it. There are no rewards for being godly. There are no punishments for being ungodly. You just live and you die and that's it. Okay, so if that's you today and you have similar beliefs, you picked the right day to be here. Because Jesus is going to explain this. We're going to talk it through. Now, Mark makes certain to define the difference. What are they asking about? It's not really about marriage. They're trying to trick Jesus up on the resurrection. So they ask this question. Who is your spouse in heaven? A lot of you aren't going to like this message today. I'm sorry. All right. Who is your spouse in heaven? Let's talk this through. This would have been an apologetic tool for the Sadducees. This would have been their trick question. Anybody who believed in the resurrection, they would have used this argument to them. All right, and they'd walk through And you know what? They can, because it's found in Deuteronomy chapter 25. It was in the book of the law that, okay, you can remarry. If, if you die and your widow doesn't have any children, your brother is supposed to marry her, and he's supposed to have children with her. It makes sense. It keeps the money and the properties in the family. It keeps the name going, and it protects the widow. All these things they were supposed to do. And that's true. And yes, if it happened seven times, it would have been okay for her to be married seven times. It's, it's legal in the Bible. So they had actually a valid question, but it was ludicrous when you think about it. Seven times she married and never had a child. So that really wasn't the question. The question was, do you believe in the resurrection? Now, is she going to be married to bachelor number one, her true love? All right. Obviously, number one has to be her true love. Or is she going to be married to bachelor number seven, who is obviously much younger than her? Okay. Obviously, you know, she did well with him. So which is it going to be? Is it number two, three, four, five? Who do I get to pick in heaven? All right. If we have eternity, who am I married to? So why is it a trap? It's a trap for two reasons. One, if Jesus can't answer the question, which nobody has been able to. If you believe in the resurrection, no one had been able to answer this question. They thought it was an unanswerable question. So they pose the unanswerable question to a rabbi. And if the rabbi says, I don't know, his followers are going to lose credibility in him. They're not going to trust him anymore because he couldn't answer the question. Jesus had never failed to answer a question. So here, we got him. If he really believes in the resurrection like he teaches, he can't answer this question. But, on the other hand, if he sides with us and says, all right, guys, I give, there is no resurrection, then again, he loses credibility with his followers because he teaches the resurrection, and the Pharisees get really ticked off because they believe in it. You see, it's a dilemma. Jesus can't win, or can he? All right, let's talk about the reversal. Jesus steps right into this question with full force, and he says, your mistake is, your mistake is, here Jesus is referring to their mistaken belief that there is no resurrection. The question is a trick. It has nothing to do with the, resurre or with the resurrection itself, but indirectly it does. So Jesus, being aggressive at this point, cuts right to the heart of the matter and says, you are wrong about the resurrection and here's why. You're ignorant of God's word. You are ignorant of God's word. This was a huge slap in the face because these were the most intelligent people of the day and the greatest book of all of their day was the Bible, not like our day. The Bible was considered to be the ultimate textbook, the ultimate authority. Everything fell underneath God's word in that first century, period. And these guys were the elite intellectual people on God's word. And what did he say? You don't know God's word. Wow. That's a slap. Jesus is being bold. So I am not a scholar. Uh, I, I am, uh, you know, have my degree. But I don't know nearly as much about the Old Testament as the Sadducees or the Pharisees or any of those guys. 
But I know some things about the Old Testament. Here's a passage I want you to think about. After my body, my physical body, has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. After my body decays, in my body I'll see God. Who was that? That was Job. And Job is the oldest book of the Bible, the oldest known writing of the Bible. Job existed sometime before the time of Moses, most believe. And Job was a godly man, a godly father, a very wealthy man, very productive man. And Satan says he's only that way because you're good to him, God. He's only that way because you bless him. If you let me touch him, he'll curse you and I win. And so God says, OK, you can touch his stuff. And so Satan touches his stuff. He touches his family. He takes away his wealth. Yeah, Job is hurt. He's crushed. But he says, bless the Lord, right? He doesn't give in. And, Job, and Satan's like, all right, all right. He's got his health. If you let me touch him physically, he'll curse you, God. And Job says, all right, when he's sick, he still won't curse God. Instead, what he relies on is this verse behind me. No matter how sick I am, no matter how much loss I experience, no matter the death of my family, no matter the, the loss of my money and my cattle and my herds, I know, no matter what, that when I die and my body decays, I will see God in my flesh. In other words, I will be resurrected. Job believed, and that's how he got through his troubles in life, was his confidence in the resurrection. And that's in the Old Testament. How did they miss it? How about another one? Why should I fast when he's dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day. Who said that? King David. King David, just like us, can get caught up in sin. And he did in his early 50s. His life kind of degraded and he started backing off and getting apathetic with God's word, getting apathetic with God's people. Lo and behold, he gets into adultery. He's an attractive woman. He has sex with her that she gets pregnant. He says, oh, no, we're going to get stoned to death. I've got to cover this up. So he kills her husband to cover it up and marries her. I mean, come on. Hollywood cannot do any better than the Bible stories. And this is real. And so he thinks I've covered it up. I've sinned, I've sinned, I've sinned, and I've sinned some more. Surely it's going to be great now. I've made it right. I married her. We have the baby. Yay. Nope. You don't hide anything from God. God is just. What you sow, you will reap. And so he says, guess what? The baby's going to die. Because of your sin, the baby's going to die. And David mourned. And he grieved. And he wept. And they were scared. The people with him thought, man, I don't know what he's going to do. He's going to die too. The baby died and he perked up. He went and he showered. He got something to eat. Got back to work. And they're like, holy cow. How did you endure the death of your child? How did you get through this? We thought you were going to die too. And he says this, I'll go to him. I can't bring him back. I'll go to him. In other words, he believed in the resurrection. He believed that after he died, he would see his child that had died before him. How did they miss it? They may not have liked Job. He was just the average guy. But David was one of their great kings. How did they miss this truth in the resurrection? I'll tell you how. They miss it like a lot of people miss God's word today. They only believed what they wanted to believe. When it came to the Bible, they only believed what fit their belief system, not what God said. They only literally believed the first five books of the Bible were true. That's all they believed that were primary truth. The Sadducees said Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the law. And we're going to stick to it. Everything else is just supportive documents. Maybe Job was just a parable. Maybe Job never really existed and he's just a good story that we tell our kids that, hey, you can get through hard times. Maybe David was just, again, finding a way to cope with the grief, the death of, death of his child. And, OK, I'm going to die, too, just like him. They could argue these things away because I don't believe that part of the Bible. I just throw this in. We're going to talk about it. You can't believe just part of the Bible. You can't say this is true and this is not. It's true from Genesis to Revelation. And we don't get to pick and choose. That's what the Pharisees had, or Sadducees had done. They picked the parts of the Bible that they would agree with, and they put away their other parts that they didn't agree with. And funny thing is, Jesus referred to parts that they agreed with. He gave them a quote from Genesis, or Exodus, excuse me. He said, how about this one, guys? I am the God of your father, a God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am, two important letters, am. Present tense, currently. When you study the Hebrew, that's what it means. I am currently the God of these dead men. 
If they just died as the Sadducees say, and they cease to exist as the Sadducees believe, then God cannot be the God of them because they don't exist anymore. I am the God of them even though they died hundreds of years ago because I'm the God of the living. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though they died, they live today. That's the statement he's making. You say you believe the Bible. You say you believe those first five books. Here you go. Right in the first five books of the Bible, here's the resurrection truth. I am, God says, the God of the living, not the dead. Right? Think about it. Powerful statement when he makes to these guys. You have failed in your intelligence of the Bible. You're ignorant of God's word. And that's why you don't believe in the resurrection. Next thing he says, you're ignorant of God's power. Wow, this is another slap in the face. You're ignorant of God's power. They believed in Genesis. That God can create everything out of nothing. That God gave us life and breathed the soul into our bodies. But they can't believe that God can raise the dead. They failed to believe the stories of Elijah. It says the Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned. He is revived in the Hebrew. It means to be restored to life or to be given new life. There it was. One of their great prophets was able by the power of God to resurrect someone. Moving on, Elisha and Elisha, as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. The body had been cold. That child was dead. Just like the other child, if he brought him back to life, they'd literally be zombies because their soul had died when their body died, if their theory was right. But remember, they don't believe kings. The books of kings are just not true. They only believe Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Even though they knew that Elijah and Elisha were powerful prophets and they heard their stories, they didn't necessarily give them the credibility they required. So think about this one, though. Let's go back to Genesis. Let's go back to their father, Father Abraham. Let's put this next passage on the screen. Abraham says this, the boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship here and then we will come back. You know the story, most of you. Abraham was blessed to have Isaac at 100 years old. And Isaac is going to be the seed of many nations. So numerous that you can't count the stars in the sky. The stand on the seashore. And so this is the promised child. This is the one who everything hinges upon. And God says, no, I want you to sacrifice your only son. Should sound familiar. I want you to offer your only son to me. Give him to me. And so he packs up the mules. He takes his servants. He takes his son Isaac. They go out and they head to Mount Moriah. And he gets close enough. He says, all right, you guys stay back here. It's just me and the boy. Just the two of us are going to go ahead and we're going to worship. And we're going to sacrifice. And we, not me, are going to come back. The author of Hebrews tells us Abraham could do this knowing that even if Isaac died, God would raise him from the dead. Their own patriarch, Abraham, believed in the resurrection. It's there and very clear. And yet they ignore the power of God. So Jesus gave the only true answer, the only correct answer that was possible. For those who believed in this. And he said, just like the angels, you will not be married. Let's talk about the resurrected state. So Jesus gives the answer, and this is critical. I, I know a lot of people don't like this. Uh, but let's just get it out of the way. We won't have halos in heaven. I don't know where that came from. I think it came from old third century Jesus pictures. Right? If you ever go to Europe or if you go to some of these old countries that have these old um, places. And you find the old icons and things. I think that's where it came from. They just put halos. I don't know what's a halo anyway. Uh, we're not going to wear white robes and we're not going to have wings. We're not going to play harps. Okay. Some might. I don't know. And we're not going to float around on clouds and be boring when we die. Thank you. Right. That's not heaven. And it's definitely not heaven. So what does it actually look like briefly? One, we will not be married. I'm sorry. We will not be married because Jesus said what? We won't be married. So like it or not. You're not going to be married when you're in heaven. Let me explain that, okay? Let me explain that in a couple of verses. First uh, Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul makes this statement. He says, because there's so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. And it goes on to speak of the physical relationship. So God allows us to marry because of our sinful nature, to protect us. Sex within the bi biblical union of marriage is precious and it's pure. And that's how God protects us because of our sinful nature. Outside of it, it's sexual immorality. So he gives us marriage to protect us. When we die and we're resurrected, we don't have the sexual sin in our life. We're, we don't have to worry about it, so we don't need to be married to protect us. The second thing is in Malachi chapter 2, God speaks through Malachi to explain why divorce is so bad. 
Because God wants to create through this marriage the next godly generation. That's God's intent on marriage is that we produce kids to go into the next generation and take his kingdom with them. After we die and we're raised again, we never die again. So there is no more reproduction. And we're already perfect, so we don't have to worry about the next generation. So we don't need to be married. So no, you won't be married. Will you know your spouse? Absolutely. But you'll love everyone equally in heaven. Right? I'll love you just as much as I, I love my wife more than anybody right now. But when we get to heaven, I'm going to love you just as much as I love her. Faith, hope, and love, the greatest thing is love. And that's the way it happens. So we don't need marriage at that point. So no, we're not married. We're like the angels. We're single. All right, we're all bachelors and bachelorettes. Another thing we see is we will be identifiable. And we can say if it's like angels, angels are identifiable. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. They have names. You can see them and recognize them. All right? Think about the transfiguration. I love to talk about that. These guys, John, Mark, and these guys knew this was real. John, Peter, and James were there when two fellows came down and talked with Jesus. And who were those guys? Elijah and Moses. They had been dead for hundreds of years or gone for hundreds of years. And yet they what? Recognized them. I know those guys. I see them. They have names. They're real. After they left this earth. The greatest example, obviously, is who? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus, it's about to happen in the story. He's going to die. They're going to see him die. They're going to put his body in a tomb. And three days later, they're going to be with him again. He's going to get up and walk out of the tomb in a body that they can touch, that they can talk to, that they can eat with, they can laugh with, they can cry with. He has a physical body after his resurrection that they recognize who he is and spend time with him. There's the evidence. If you don't have anything else, you've got that. We will be resurrected in identifiable bodies. We will know each other. And finally, we will be productive. God created work in the Garden of Eden, didn't He? All right, He did. He gave work from the Garden of Eden. Why? Because we find our satisfaction in working. We find our purpose in working. All throughout creation, man has worked. It's just what we do. And we will be working when we're resurrected. The Scriptures say we will rule and reign with Christ. We will be productive. Not angels floating around in clouds with halos playing harps. It's a literal, physical experience after death. We will be resurrected. Jesus makes that truth very abundantly clear. So, the Sadducees are wrong. They're wrong on two accounts. One, they think they can trick Jesus. But two, they're wrong. More importantly, they made a serious error on the resurrection. Don't make that error. You've heard all the truth that you need to hear. Let me give you one more piece, okay? We're going to cover this in a few weeks. It says, then, at the end, the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed in my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. All right? The ones on the right, who are they? They're the ones who believed in Jesus Christ and the salvation. They're the ones who've repented of their sins and turned to God. They're the ones who have chosen to follow God because of his leading. They're on the right. And they step into paradise for eternity. The ones on the left, who are they? Then the king, Jesus, will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones. Into what? Not annihilation, not the abyss, but into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. Right or left? No Jesus, no Jesus. That's the difference. So where do we stand? How do we, how do we have an invitation for something like this? Well, we consider the crowd. Two kinds of people in this crowd. Followers of Jesus and haters of Jesus. So let's talk about the followers because we fit in that category. Most of us here today. What were they learning? Jesus was teaching something. What were they learning? First, they were learning the hope of the resurrection. There may have been some in Jesus' followers who still doubted. All right, they haven't seen the resurrected Christ yet. Like we know that you're the resurrected. They have heard him talk about, but some of them are doubting probably. Some of them are wondering, is this real? Is this true? Is this mystical? Jesus is making it clear. No, you will be resurrected. So some of us in this room may just need a reminder of the resurrection. We may need the hope of Job. And that's why I thought about it. Maybe you're suffering. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're going through things that you just think are unbearable. Remember, this world is not your home. You have the hope of the resurrection in you. And you know that there is paradise. There's a kingdom that God has given to you from the beginning of time that waits for you. 
So like Job, just, just pray, God, I know that even when my body decays, I will see you in my flesh. I will be resurrected. That's how you endure. Just like David, how do you endure the death of a loved one in this life? The same way, because of the hope of the resurrection. You can say, yes, this hurts me. Yes, it breaks my heart, but I will see them again. Right? I will see them again. So maybe that's you. Maybe that's you in this group. Then there are those who, like the Sadducees, who just want to believe parts of the Bible. And there probably were people in Jesus' group who felt that way. I like this part. I don't like that part. I agree with this part. I don't agree with that part. Your agreement is not required. You need to step back. If you profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, every word has to be true. You can't say, I just believe the words of Jesus. I don't like the words of Paul. Paul's words carry the same weight that Jesus' words carry. They are preserved in God's word so that we will be obedient and follow. And so you don't get to pick and choose which parts of the Bible you like. If it's God's word, it has to be true. And we have to surrender to it. So be very careful of that. Because I guarantee you there are people in that group just as there are in this group. Surrender to all of God's word being true if you're a believer. The second group are those who hated Jesus. I just get chills thinking about being in the presence of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? They are there. In the temple, the most holy place on earth, with the most holy person who's ever stepped foot on earth. And yet they're rejecting him. And guess who's with him? Lazarus. And guess when it just happened? Less than a week ago, Jesus showed the proof of the resurrection by raising his good friend who had been in the tomb for days. He said, Lazarus, come forth. He should have been rotted because he was decaying. But he came out. And he's there with Jesus as he's entered into the city. Proving the resurrection is true. What more do you need? If you're rejecting Jesus Christ, remember, that's the left. That's the ones he said enter into eternal damnation, eternal judgment, because you reject him. You've heard his truth again today. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is our Savior. He is the one who died for our sins. We can be forgiven of everything we've ever committed if we just ask. He will give us the hope of eternal life. It's the gift that only he can give. Today, if that's you, I just, I beg you, don't leave on the left. God, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, we lift you up and just worship you as only you ask us to do. Thank you for your word, which is truth, and God, thank you for the direction it gives us. Thank you for the promise of the resurrection that's very clearly spelled out from Genesis to Revelation in your word. And thank you for the hope that that gives us in this lost and decaying world. Um, God, may we as Christians be reminded of that. May it reflect in our lives and show up in the joy that we can have only through Jesus Christ. Those who don't know you, thank you so much for trusting them in our presence today. Um, they've heard a lot about Christianity and about religion, but today they've heard about the most important truth. There is life after death, and Jesus Christ makes the difference on where that is spent. So, God, I just pray that their hearts will be so burdened that this will be the day that they'll come forward. So slip out of the pew and come down and tell us, I want to follow Jesus Christ. This will be the day of their salvation. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This is your time to respond.